Masochist says, hurt me. Sadist replies, no. Hello everyone, Tadas Vinokur here. It's a good day today in San Francisco because I will be reviewing a book that gets me properly jacked up. Namely, Gilles Deleuze, Masochism, Coldness and Cruelty. I think this is a unique opportunity for me to discuss Deleuze theory as a linkage of various intellectual disciplines and methodologies. This book is a real cornucopia of philosophical, psychoanalytic, sexual, and literary suggestions. Deleuze as a philosopher of imminence, Deleuze as a historian of philosophy, as an eager advocate for concepts, as a metaphysician, and even as a schizoanalyst, Deleuze in all his intellectual greatness and intensity can be exhibited here in this very book, Masochism. Hence, I urge you to drop everything you're doing right now and just read the freaking book. Also, this book brings forth an original take on so-called queer theory by conceptualizing a distinct kind of queer masochist subjectivity. Well, my task today is, is, is kind of simple. I will try to comment on the extremely you know, multifaceted edifice of Deleuze's work by reviewing this particular book. And, and more importantly, I will try to describe the masochist perspective as a deeply complex and dramatic way to relate to the world and to other human beings. Before I even begin, I would just like to put it out there. Masochism in this book has, has nothing to do with this cursory, frivolous proclivity to inflict pain upon oneself. Indeed, we have yet to wrap our heads around the complexity of this supposedly self-evident dichotomy of sa sadism and masochism. These two terms are too often perceived as, as psychic, social, or political shortcomings, ailments, or pathologies. In fact, they're everything but that. The first step in the analysis of masochism ought to be the following. We have to un understand that all people possess the sadistic and masochistic tendencies within their psyche, which, under the right circumstances, will be manifested and certain degree of violence will be exhibited. Violence is no good, taught us. So, let's begin at the beginning. What does Deleuze say about the dichotomy of sadism and masochism? Well, Deleuze begins by saying something that is symptomatic of his philosophical perspective in general. He says that these terms, sadism and masochism, in the same way as all other terms that denote pathologies do, they connote other signs. They connote other signs. These are concepts that connote and are linked to other concepts. They don't really describe something at hand or, or real. In the real world, you know, following Kant, there's no sadism and manic or, or masochism. Sadism and masochism, they're just words that connote other signs. That is to say, the term such as masochism simply describes and encapsulates the relation of signs with other signs. Masochism then, as a word, introduces a linguistic and semiotic gesture which tries to generalize certain perhaps masochistic, symptoms, behaviors, attributes, and the like. This means that before we even begin, masochism and sadism is a troubled dichotomy. Sadistic and masochistic be behaviors are often intricately intertwined. They're full of paradoxes, tautologies, paraproxies, and other quandaries. Clues here quotes Bataille, who says that, the language of Saad is paradoxical because it is essentially that of the victim. Only a victim can describe the practices of torture because the torturer has better things to do. His language is that of authority. The violent man keeps quiet, right? Think of the political bullies who don't like to talk about violence. 
Why? Because that would put pressure on them. At any rate, sadomasochism is a term that we use quite often. It is deep-rooted within our everyday jargon. So let's look at what makes sadism and masochism complementary or reciprocal. According to Deleuze, the strange relationship between pleasure in doing and suffering evil has always been sensed by doctors and writers who have recorded humans' in intimate life. Sadomasochism as a concept was not invented by Freud alone, Deleuze says. This sadomasochistic reciprocity is in fact very evident in the writing of Saad and Mazak. And I just wanted to remind you that throughout this book, Deleuze is reflecting upon the writing of Mazak. He is the person whose, whose name we use to describe masochistic behavior. In Saad's The 120 Days of Sodom, we are told of the tortures and humiliations that the libertines undergo. Saint Fond, a character in Saad's Juliet, arranges for a gang of men to assail him with whips. Similarly, there's a certain degree of sadism and masochism. Uh, Severin, the hero of Mazak's Venus in Furs, declares himself cured and turns to whipping and torturing women. However, Deleuze is not trying to say that masochism always turns into sadism and vice versa. He's saying that masochism, for instance, will appear in sadistic environment as a byproduct, as a humorous outcome of sadism. However, it is unclear, Deleuze says, if this sadism that appears in masochistic environment is the same sadism that functions in sadistic praxis. Hmm. Deleuze then presents a short and rather superficial joke. Masochist says, hurt me. Sadist replies, no. Well, this interaction, as funny as it might be, is unrealistic and rather stupid, according to Deleuze, mainly because a genuine sadistic person would never tolerate a masochistic victim. From this follows that even though there are some shared attributes between masochist and sadistic worlds, they are nonetheless, according to Deleuze, separate. To this end, Deleuze discusses Freud, who was one of the main theorists who constructed the concept sadomasochism. In Deleuze's opinion, Freud took up and reformulated the concept of sadomasochism. He started with the consideration that sadomasochism operates within one and the same individual, involving opposites, opposite instincts and drives. To quote Freud, A person who feels pleasure in producing pain in someone else in a sexual relationship is also capable of enjoying as pleasure any pain which he may himself derive from sexual relations. A sadist is always at the same time a masochist. A sadist is always at the same time a masochist, Freud says. Deleuze, however, critiques this Freudian perspective by saying that if we begin with the assumption of sadomasochism, we begin with a heavy-handed abstraction. According to Deleuze, even though sadists might may definitely enjoy being hurt, it doesn't it does not follow that he enjoys enjoys being hurt the same way as a masochist would. Likewise, the masochist's pleasure in, in inflicting pain is not necessarily the same as, a, as, as the sadist. Deleuze thinks that we shouldn't fall into evolutionism by aligning in a single chain results that, even though approximately continuous, imply irreducible and heterogeneous form formations. Deleuze thinks that the concurrence of sadism is fundamentally one of analogy only. Their processes and formations are entirely different. Well, if they are different, what makes masochism so special? According to Deleuze, masochist perspective privileges the maternal figure. Now, we are going right back to the Freud's Oedipal Triad. According to Freud, in his The Passing of the Oedipus Complex, 
there are two possible outcomes of the Oedipal problem. The active sadistic, where a child identifies with the father, and the passive masochistic, where he instead takes the place of the mother and desires to be loved by the father. To some extent, then, masochism does encapsulate the exaltation of the feminine figure. It does not mean that the masochist identifies with the mother, but he does live in and thrive on the feminine or maternal symbolism. The masochist experiences the symbolic order as an intermaternal order in which the mother represents the law under certain prescribed conditions. She generates the symbolism under which the masochist experiences himself. This way, Deleuze critiques the psychoanalytic establishment, which constantly reiterates the concept of the name of the father, which represents the law or the imperative. I ought to do the way my father wants me to do. Well, for Deleuze, the law is not an exclusive faculty of the father. Maternal law is also a fertile ground for imperative creation, which, as it happens, constitutes the playground of the masochist. So what does the masochistic playground look like? For Deleuze, the masochistic relationship describes most likely a male subject who is able to disavow the name of the father or the heteronormative law by positioning a cruel and a cold woman, a femme fatale, a dominatrix, if you will, in front of himself, the masochist engages in the creative production of sexuality and desire. Here, the boundaries between domination and submission are constantly effaced. The masochist erects the contract, which simulates a law, but can never become the law. That is to say, the masochist actively creates the contours of this masochistic engagement or arrangement. He defines the liaison between the dominatrix and himself, but, but paradoxically, this arrangement is always based on the premise of submission. Within the masochistic relationship, the masochist is presented with fetishes, such as fur or high heels or whips, which can only allude to the total submission, but can never arrive at it. They can only allude to it. The masochist then is in a paradoxical position. He dominates the contract because he is the one who created it, but at the same time he's totally humiliated by the contract, by the contract because he's a masochist. He has to submit. The interaction between the masochist and the dominant woman, therefore, is that of the perpetual disavowal of agency. Neither of them can be thought of as subjects because they both exist in the contours of the masochistic contract only. The masochistic desire for submission can never be fulfilled. It is rather always deferred by material symbols and fetishes. Fetishes. By engaging in this perpetual foreplay, the masochist and the dominant woman come very close to being representatives of the delusion body without organs, which represents a total disavowal of hierarchic and heteronormative and binary structures in favor of fluctuations and oscillations of desire. This approach can be interpreted as performant through repetition, materiality, and foreplay and interpol interpolation. Masochistic relationship is able to create and recreate new sexual identities. Finally, I would like to end the segment by quoting Deleuze. Let us now try to summarize the results of our inquiry. Sadism is speculative demonstrative, masochism dialectical imaginative. Sadism operates with the negative and pure negation, made masochism with disavowal and suspension. Sadism operates by means of quantitative reiteration, masochism by means of qualitative suspense. There is a masochism specific to the sadist and 
equally a sadism specific to the masochist. The one never combining with the other. This book tells us that the sexual identity is never fixed. It functions like a boomerang. You know, even though the purpose of the boomerang is to hunt down the animal, the other purpose is, is also to miss the animal so that the boomerang could boomerang back, right? The masochist is the one who appreciates this, this supposedly unproductive sexual behavior. He loves his dominatrix, he loves the fetish. By the same token, the dominatrix is not just cold and cruel, she's also caring. She orders people to be whipped and stoned, maybe, and yet she's gentle about it. By participating within the masochistic relationship, they both liberate the sexual fantasy. Let us all be brave enough to liberate this fantasy. Have a good day.